So uh, my name is Adam Driscoll. Um, I was a PowerShell MVP. I'm a cloud and data center MVP. Um, I work for a consulting firm out of uh, the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. I uh, do a lot of system center and uh, Azure kind of stuff. Um, I also worked on the PowerShell tools for Visual Studio, so that you might have seen that around. Um, so started that project. Thank you very much. So um, you'll be seeing that in the next couple of versions of Visual Studio, I hope. And uh, yeah, so I'm a senior application developer at Concurrency. Um, so, getting started with uh, PowerShell classes, I kind of want to talk a little bit about object-oriented design just because um, to understand exactly what classes are, you kind of need to understand a little bit about object orientation. So the idea with object orientation is that um, it's a programming paradigm based on the fact that everything is an object. So you don't just have, you know, functions and scripts and variables, you have these objects that have particular properties or fields uh, related to them. So that kind of uh, maintains the state of those objects. You also have... Um, functions or procedures, often called methods in the .NET world, and that is actually processes that take place on that object. That object might be able to interact with other objects, um, it may change the state of that particular object, um, but everything is composed of an object. So when we start thinking about classes, we can kind of think of a class as a blueprint. So this is a blueprint for a GI Joe crossfire. So you can look at the blueprint, it's like calling different things out, you know, different states of this object. It has four wheels, it can be on and off, it can be turning left or right, it has a particular speed. Those would be the different, you know, properties of this particular GI Joe car. Um, the other thing that it does is it has different functions that you can apply to it. So you can turn it left, you can turn it right, uh, you can go forward and back, probably can shoot the gun or something like that. Those are the different uh, you know, methods for this GI Joe car. When you actually create an instance of that GI Joe car, that is an object. So it's based on that particular uh, you know, uh, blueprint, but you can create many objects based on that blueprint. So when we define classes, that's what we're defining. We're defining that blueprint for the GI Joe car. And then when we actually create them with commands like new object, we're actually creating instances of that GI Joe car. So there's a couple benefits of OOP um, that are kind of important to note when uh, kind of getting into object-oriented programming. Uh, the first is encapsulation, then inheritance, and then polymorphism. So those are kind of some of the basic uh, terms that you'll hear uh, when researching OOP. So the first is encapsulation. So um, this looks like a mess, and you probably have no idea what it's doing. It's hard to figure out. You'd have to know exactly what all those wires are doing to be able to do anything with this particular you know, circuit here. The same goes for scripts. So, you know, I've written scripts where, you know, everything's a global variable and you're just hacking out functions and it gets really messy really quickly. And you hand it off to your coworker, they can't figure it out because they have to know exactly about everything about that script to be able to work with it. The same, and that's why we have this concept of encapsulation in uh, classes. So the idea being is you have something like this, where on the left hand side is the inside of that Wii remote. You know, there's all kinds of circuits, there's uh, different, you know, resistors and capacitors, there's the GRO for, like, you know, moving your hand around and stuff. But you don't really need to know how that works to be able to use a Wii remote. You just flick your wrist, you press a button, and that's because all that logic is encapsulated inside that remote, and then we have a simple interface on the outside of it. The same goes for classes. You have simple methods, um, simple states, but all the logic is kind of hidden within that particular object. The other benefit that we get is inheritance. So, not quite as the same as inheriting money, but the idea with inheritance is that you have base classes. And base classes have particular properties that you can inherit from other classes. So, on the top here we have a wagon. A wagon has wheels, you can, you can steer it, that kind of thing. Um, but what you can do is you can think of uh, other four-wheeled vehicles. They're more specific versions of a wagon. They introduce new functionality. They, um, behave a little bit differently. They might look different. So on the left you have a car, it's got an engine. It still has four wheels, it can still steer, but it's a more specific version of a wagon. On the right hand side you have a four wheel bike. You know, you pedal it, it can still steer. And from there you can actually base class down to, you know, even more specific versions. Flying cars or Teslas, you know, a bike with a little roof on top of it so you don't get wet in the rain. But the same core concept and the same properties that are available in the base class are also available in all the classes below it. So I want to show you some examples of how we can create base classes and how we can inherit that functionality so we don't have to re-implement the concept of a wheel in all our classes. Uh, finally, there's polymorphism. 
So polymorphism is kind of the idea that you can abstract away some of the uh, implementation details based on those base classes. So a good example is an example of remotes. So all these remotes do different things. All these, you know, I think the one on the left is maybe a TV remote, middle is a receiver, and the right one's a direct TV remote. They all have different buttons, you know, they look really complicated, but they all do a similar thing. They all make, come from a, you know, a base class remote that can turn on a device. They all have a power switch. So the idea being is you could hand it to someone like grandma and say, I just want you to know about the power script, or the power switch. You are a remote that can turn things on and off and that's all you need to know. So we can do something similar with classes um, where we'll be able to pass base class implementations to other classes and they only need to know about the very basics of the class and not all the other uh, details that come along with it. And I'll get into some examples and I'm going to run this mostly as a demo so I encourage you guys to ask questions and I'm just going to kind of uh, go with the flow. But why do we want uh, classes in PowerShell? For a long time, uh, .NET developers in general, who have come from like a C-sharp background and come to PowerShell and like, we want classes. And we want classes because we want to integrate with .NET better. We want classes because we want to write something that's familiar to us rather than just scripts and uh, modules and that kind of thing. But the real reason that uh, classes eventually got implemented was for the implementation of DSC resources. So if you've ever implemented a DSC resource, a script-based DSC resource, um, it takes quite a few steps and you have to actually use uh, the MOF file format and, to author your, your class. And it, you know, it makes you get out of PowerShell. You have to do two different things to import it and everything. So it takes a couple steps and it's not really uh, PowerShell friendly. So um, that's how we got classes in PowerShell was to implement DSC resources. And I'll show you guys some examples of that. And then finally, we can take advantage of some of those object <laughs> techniques I just talked about. Um, actually extend from classes in the .NET framework, implement interfaces so that we can uh, call particular methods we would not be, be able to call previously in PowerShell. Um, so we're kind of entering a, a, a different realm um, in terms of PowerShell authoring. All right, so let's switch over to a demo. So if June was here, she'd yell at me because she told, told me never to actually type in a demo. So I'm going to do this entire demo typing. <laughs> All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to use the new class keyword. The new class keyword is really straightforward. It looks just like you know, you're defining a function or a workflow or whatever, a configuration. Um, and then the name of your type is uh, what follows. So class bike. I have a bike. So now what you can see is as simple as that, I have a type defined. No reason to call add type, write C sharp code, specify you know, all kinds of weird string, um, you know, escape characters and stuff like that. We have a type defined, just like a date time object. It looks very similar. Except it won't let me cast that. Um, right, so it's the same concept. It's a, a type available. And it's actually a .NET type. So it actually compiles down to actual .NET code. So now we want to add some uh, properties to this bike. So what does a bike have? A bike has maybe a manufacturer, um, a bike has a model, and a bike has a year. So what you can see here is I've defined different particular properties of this bike. On the left hand side here you'll see that uh, this is actually a type qualifier. It specifies what type uh, this variable or property of this object is. Um, and if you omit that, which this is optional, it becomes a type object. And, and everything in .NET uh, inherits from object, because everything is an object. So then you can uh, assign any particular value to that particular property. So now if I wanted to create a new instance of my bike, what I could use is new object. Just like any other .NET type, that's my talk that stops. You can see I can create a new instance of that bike. And it actually lists out the properties. I have a manufacturer, a model, and a year. Not very interesting because none of them are set. Um, but what we could do is we could actually specify default values. So if I want to say, you know, my default value for a year is 2016. So now every time I create a bike, it defaults to 2016. But it doesn't make much sense to have a bike without a manufacturer or a model. So let's actually create a constructor. A constructor is the method that is called when you actually create an instance of a class. So, ooh. manufacturer. 
Um, so by default, there's always a default constructor created where it is just an empty, uh, an empty method with no parameters that does nothing. In this case, this is a non-default constructor and it requires that you pass in two parameters. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to want to set the manufacturer and model on this instance of the object. And that's where you use the this keyword. This keyword is referring to the current instance of this class. So in this case, I would say this.manufacturer. And then I take the value that was passed in uh, for the constructor. So now if I go to actually create my bike, what you'll see is you'll see an error. Because it says the constructor was not found. Since we overrode the default constructor, we can no longer create this object without the, uh, specifying those two parameters. So if you ever use a new object to actually create objects, what you can do is you can say argument list and then pass in two arguments. So now when I create my bike, it has a manufacturer, it has a model, it has a year. So that's really cool. While we're on the topic of creating new objects, let's actually check out one of the new operators that's available in PowerShell. So if you haven't seen this syntax before, it's actually a new syntax that was added in PowerShell v5 to actually create objects. So instead of having to use the uh, new object command line, you can use the shortened syntax where you say the type name followed by two colons and then new and pass in the arguments that you're going to call the constructor. So it just kind of shortens the syntax. It's another way to create objects, but it does the exact same thing that a uh, new object does. All right, so let's make this bike do something. So one thing that bikes do are, uh, is that they pedal. So let's create a pedal method. So pedal, or methods look a lot like functions. Uh, they have the function name pedal, and then two parentheses where you could put uh, arguments, and then a uh, method body. You can see I put void in front of there. Void is the return type of this particular method. So with methods, you always need to specify a return type, otherwise it doesn't know what it is. So in this case, we say method void. We're not going to return anything from pedal, but we want it to do something. So okay, we want it to increase the speed. Every time you pedal it, let's increase the speed. So I set this. I create a speed property, and then um, let's set the speed. Oops, not com spec. Oops, I have to say this. I always have to say this. All right, so now I increase the speed every time I call pedal. So let's create a new bike, start in variable. And we can call pedal on it now. And we can dump bike cap. All right, we're back. All right, so now you can see that when I pedal my bike, uh, the speed goes up. There's one problem with our, uh, our speed variable though. I can just set speed to whatever I want. Now my speed's 100, I don't have to pedal anything. I wish my bike at home worked that way, right? But to, do, to alleviate that uh, problem, what we want to do is, this is where in, in the concept of encapsulation comes into play. We want to hide this speed variable. So now when I try to run this, you can see that speed is no longer available because it's hidden. It no longer lets me set the speed because it's hidden and only that particular instance of that object can modify the speed. And that allows us to uh, control the internal state of this object, not allow people to mess with our speed without calling pedal. But let's say I wanted to get the speed. I, I do still want to know how fast I'm going, so let's put a little speedometer on there. So we can say int get speed return this dot speed. All right, so this is a, a definition of a method that has a return value. You can see I, instead of void, I'm doing int because I'm going to be returning an integer. And I'm using the return statement to actually return that internal variable. So although we, can, we can't set speed from outside the object, we can actually return the actual value of speed via this, this function here now. So if I pedal there, you can see now it returned uh, that my speed is 1 because I pedaled once with that. So a couple interesting notes about uh, methods in dot, or, uh, PowerShell classes. You need the return statement. If I get rid of this return statement, uh, you can see it's going to give me an error that it says not all code pass uh, return a value within this method. It's required to return a value if uh, you are specifying a return type like this. 
And when it says not all code paths, you have to make sure that if you have uh, if else statements and maybe return something in the if statement but not in the else statement, it'll still give you that error because you need to you are required to return something from this method. The other thing to note is that the return statement itself is required. If you were actually writing a function in PowerShell, you wouldn't have to use a return statement to get something to return from that method, which is another really interesting difference between PowerShell methods and PowerShell functions. So if I had a function that was called getSpeed, and I did the same thing where I just said, you know, speed, which would be like one, and I called getSpeed, it doesn't give me any errors. You know, I can run this and it outputs one. But the other thing that's interesting is I might do one here and then one here and call get speed. What do you expect? It's going to return two, right? Because you're jumping two objects to the pipeline in this case. So you get two, two ones. If I do the same thing up here, where I put one in there and call get speed, I only get one. That's because the uh, PowerShell methods don't actually have access to <coughs> two things to the, the PowerShell stream or the pipeline. So it doesn't, that, that uh, one is just thrown away when that's executed. And what's interesting about PowerShell or methods as well is that there are actually script blocks. They are not compiled completely to um, C -sharp or .NET code. So you can use things like other commandlets. So in this case, I called get speed and I actually wrote to, you know, wrote to the host and said, hey, and it returned one. So there's a couple of gotchas with using methods. So it is PowerShell, but it needs to be formatted in a specific way to kind of play in the .NET world. So that's how that works. All right, so let's uh, look at one more concept, kind of basic concept that I want to talk about, and is that the fact that we can actually create enumerations. A question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's a really good question. I did not find a good way to do that. No, no, no. no there isn't. Okay. So yeah, so this kind of reminds me of Java. Property. You can do static. Yep. So you can do static properties. Yep. You can't, re you can't reassign them. They're only assigned. What's the? What's the well, you should do that. Yeah. So this would be a static property. Oh, I must have seen sharp. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, can you do more than one? Uh, Overload? Uh, yeah, but where you say new bike, can you do it with uh, one variable run or two? Yep. So uh, overloaded or nothing, exactly. So if you were to just get rid of, maybe you didn't want manufacturer in there and just wanted the model. Yeah. Yep, you could do that or you could do nothing. Okay. You, could put, you could put back in the original with nothing. If you do bike. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah like this. Yeah, then you yep. the two faults back again. Yep, exactly. Find uh, the, the class into a variable. Can you still look at the speed um, property if I just did dollar bike speed? No. So if I went bike speed. Oh wait. Maybe you can. It doesn't make sense though. Do you know why that is, Jeff? That seems like a bug. Should be hidden. Can you set it also? I think I think if you do bike bike select star, it would do the same thing. You get the speed down. Oh, I gotcha. <laughs> That's interesting.
<laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So it is hidden. It's hidden. Yep, it's there. It's available. You can use it. Huh. It's, it's hidden. It's not private. Right. I was going to say, yeah, can you probably can assign it too. Did you yeah. read I bet you could do a speed equals class? 100 on that. Uh huh. The class is getting created every time. So it really is hidden. It's not actually private. Not yeah. really. Now if you do that number, you won't see speed. Right. Unless you do dash force. Unless you do dash force, and then it'll be there. But Otherwise. you can probably do it with dot speed equals one. Yep. Yep. Interesting. We're all learning today. So then you can go um, bike speed is 100, right? Yeah, because it's no longer part of the actual object, it's part of the class itself when you mark it static. All right. Hmm? returned zero, which is kind of surprising because, well, it didn't find that. So it probably returned the default value because it didn't know what speed was. What if I did something like, yep. So I did bike speed here, and then, hmm? Oh, you're right. Know that it's there. Right. Yeah, that was broken. Yeah, that was broken. Right. We well, should sign it. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, now that we've experimented with hidden, um, I'm going to get into uh, another example. Uh, <laughs> let's create a, uh, a video game console. So a video game console has what, a company that makes it, got a string, and a uh, company that makes it, and a, just a name to it, how about. So now we can actually go off and we can create video game console. Simple enough, right? Uh, let's create a constructor that does that. So company and name, and then this that company equals company, and this that name equals name. All right, so now we can't create it without those two things. But let's say we wanted to actually create a, um, I guess a more specific version of a video game console. So just like you can create um, a video game, right? Let's extend from video game console, which is our base class now. So in this case, if I want to create an Xbox, what I can actually do is I can say video game console. And this is the syntax that you use to actually extend from another class. So in this case, Xbox is a more specific version of a video game console. It's still a video game console, but it has its own properties to it. And you can see what's happening here is the base class video game console does not contain the parameter that's constructor. Um, just like we had an issue when we were calling new before, um, in this case, uh, it can't actually even define this new class because it needs to uh, call the correct constructor. And since video or Xbox has a parameterless constructor, um, it causes this error. So what we need to do is actually call the correct constructor for the base class. So this is the syntax for that. So we say Microsoft, Xbox. And what this actually does, is, I think that's an error. Hmm? Parentheses. Parentheses for Xbox. Oh, yeah, duh. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so you can't create a video game console. It still gives an error. But now I can create an Xbox, because the Xbox actually passes in the values to the uh, base classes constructor it sets the values, and then when it's written out to the screen, uh, we can actually we have an Xbox. Now, what's neat about this is you can say, well, is this a video game console? 
Of course it is. It, it comes from video game console. But is this an Xbox? Of course it is. It is an Xbox because it's an, a, a more specific version of a video game console. So on the same vein, what we can do is we can actually create a new video game console. So if I want to create a PlayStation, what I could do is just replace all the important pieces, and now I have a PlayStation. So is a PlayStation an Xbox? No. But is a PlayStation a video game console? Yes. Because they both inherit from the same base class. So one thing that um, video game consoles can do is they can actually, uh, let's say, draw their logo. So to draw a logo, what do we do? We need to maybe find some ASCII drawing program on the internet that can convert logos into ASCII and PowerShell. <coughs> and then uh, maybe I have that snippet here. <laughs> All right, so the contents of a draw logo look like this. They take in that ASCII PS1 file, uh, they grab some uh, Xbox GIF that I have sitting around, and then they call that to actually draw this. So let's actually switch out here, um, save this, because one thing you'll notice is I am using PS script root in this particular method. And that's actually you know, a global scope variable for this particular script, so um, that's why I had to save it. So now if I do, if I want to call that, what I can use down here is change this back to Xbox, since that's where it's defined, and draw logo. Which is neat. Save that, and oops, no, save that. PowerShell. My demo. And it didn't work the same way that it worked last time. Oh. I would if it would draw the IC. Ah, uh, that looks horrible. <laughs> but you can see it took the actual Xbox logo and it drew it nasty inside PowerShell. Okay, kind of neat trick. But now let's say we want to go out and do the same thing in. Uh, the PlayStation class. So like any good developer, what do we do? Copy and paste the code, put it in the PlayStation class. All we need to do, right, is change the PlayStation logo. So let's say we have PlayStation PNG, change that, let's change this to a PlayStation, save it, run our little gimmick again, and you can see it drew the PlayStation logo rather than the Xbox logo because it's a different class that implements that. And for my next trick, <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do so that we don't need to do that is do exactly what you just said, is take that, put it in the base class, because we don't want to re-implement all that logic again, right? That's, that's why we do that. Um, what we can do is actually make that hidden, and then let's just have a file path here rather than having to pass in or have to re-implement all this logic over and over again. What we can do is we can actually just call this. So get rid of all this and we can say this.drawLogo pass in xbox.gif grab that, put that in video, or PlayStation as well and now we don't have to worry about re-implementing all that logic because twice as much code, twice as many bugs. If you need to change that for whatever reason, you have to redo it over again. So you can see now it still works the exact same way, but all the implementation details are up in the actual um, draw logo implementation inside Video Game Console. So this is all really cool, and you can do all kinds of cool stuff with um, PowerShell classes, but the other thing that you can do is you can actually extend from uh, .NET classes. So uh, what we could do is you could say class double list, and uh, there's a nifty little thing that you can do now using namespace system.collections generic. So 
Using namespace, have you ever had to type out a really long uh, type name like that before? So what using namespace allows you to do is to not have to do that. So like if I did new object type name, I could just do list int, right? Command type since ever worked. And it didn't actually, uh, here, let me actually go back to. Yeah. So that works because I'm using the namespace now, so it shortens all those namespaces. So this is kind of a concept that's always been in uh, C Sharp and VB.net where you can kind of shorten namespaces um, without having to type it out throughout your entire script. Um, but if we want to actually extend from a list like that, what we could say is double list. I think there's a bug here I was going to email people about. But I'm going to actually take this again. And we're going to extend from that class. So now we have this double list class. We say new object, double list. That works because it is just a more specific version of a uh, generic list that has integer types. But let's say we wanted to double all the input as we add it to that particular list. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new method. We're going to say add. Uh, we want to take an integers, some value, and we want to add it to the list. So there's this really cool syntax you have to use to actually get to the base class where you would actually say list int this add value. So what this actually does is it actually casts your you know, the this variable into the base class's type and then calls that version of add. Otherwise, you're going to end up calling yourself and it's going to be recursive. So in this case, what we want to actually do is multiply by 2. So every time I call add, call the base class's version. But before we do that, actually add or multiply it by 2. So we create a new double list. DL.add 2 DL. And now you can see it outputs 4. So this is an example of how we can actually extend from .NET types. So we can do all kinds of things, like I've seen examples of people extending from um, Windows Forms controls to do you know, new user controls, um, to do new windows, that kind of thing, um, without having to do any kind of um, add type stuff. So that is an example of that. All right, so now I kind of want to talk about DSC resources um, and why we have PowerShell classes at all. So if we jump back to um, here, let's actually go into Windows PowerShell modules. Uh, this is a DSC resource for Hyper-V. You can see that it has a DSC resources folder. Under, under there, it has more folders for the different types of resources. Each one of the resources is made up of a MOF file. Um, so now all of a sudden you're jumping into this MOF syntax where you, know, you have to specify all these particular attributes. You have to extend from oh my base resource. It's just really hard syntax to kind of try to remember. Um, and then when you want to implement the script, the actual uh, details of that particular DSC resource, what you need to do is actually create three particular functions. You need to create you know get target resource, set target resource, and test target resource to be able to actually uh, work with that uh, that particular resource in uh, a DSC configuration. But with PowerShell classes, they make it a lot easier. So I actually have a, uh, a DSC resource I made with um, the new PowerShell class syntax. So you can see here that uh, the way that you do this is you actually, is that big enough? Okay. Um, you use the same class keyword. And in this case, I, I have a light. So I have some like special lights at my house that I can control from the internet, which is a horrible idea. But, um, you just put a <laughs> put a, uh, a DSC resource attribute on the top of it to uh, signify that this is a DSC resource. Um, one thing that's required is a, a DSC property that is marked as a key. In this case, it's the name of the item or the name of the light in the house. Um, it, it can be a string or an integer. From there, you can add all the properties that you want. You can specify. Um, different types. Um, you can actually specify enum values. Um, and then you're required to implement three different methods. Uh, the first method is set. So obviously that updates it to the state that you set it to. 
test, test to see if it's in the state that you require it, and then get just returns that particular resource um, value here in light. So these signatures are required to be in this state for this to work. Um, and that is kind of how that works. So like in this case, it's just going out to the internet and actually setting these things. Um, and then the other side of things is just the, the manifest file that you need to make sure that you actually don't do that. Um, when you create a new module manifest, there's a new property called DSC resources to export, which apparently is not in here. I've actually installed this DSC resource already. Um, and I'll show you an example of how I use it. Let's actually open this in something that. All right, so just like you would create any other configuration, uh, you create a configuration, in this case, I'm just naming it lights. Um, and then you want to call it import DSC resource. So import DSC resource looks um, in two places for your DSC resource. Uh, it is going to look on the system wide modules folder in system 32 and MOS 64, and it's going to look in um, program files for that particular resource. It's not going to look at any of your user level uh, resources because the LCM runs as the um, system user. And then you can see that I'm just using that resource uh, as is. So in this case, I'm using my light resource and you know I want to turn on the basement light. That's the key. Uh, this is the URL. It's going to turn Bill's uh, basement light on. And then I want to set it to on sort of thing. From there, we run lights, and then we start the DSC configuration. So I can run that, and you can see that it is now running that, that DSC resource that we just created. So we actually went out and okay, went to lights. You can see it created the MOF file. And if we look in here, you can see it looks like just any other DSC resource. It's actually using that light resource. Uh, it's in the URL, the state, um, and that kind of thing. Um, and it ran on this computer. So that is how you kind of define uh, DSC resources in um, PowerShell. So it's a lot more straightforward than the actual uh, MOF format that you saw previously. All right, I feel like I totally missed something. But um, let's go back to the presentation. So that was kind of uh, my demo and everything. I want to kind of leave it open for questions. I know there were some in between, yep. Um, in terms of inherit, you would call it from the other constructor. You wouldn't really inherit from it. So, you know, you had just kind of like I showed before where you call it with that base keyword. So if you had class, you know, two and class one, you would actually have to call it with that base keyword where you'd say class one base and then call anything in there sort of thing, if that makes sense. But, um, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Probably the right person to ask. Do you know if there is ever going to be a merge of Visual, Visual Studio Code and the IAC? Um, if you were in David Wilson's uh, session earlier today, uh, that's kind of his goal. So I would definitely watch that session when it gets up on YouTube because that's what he talked about. Um, the PowerShell editor services are kind of where everything's heading. So hopefully we're going to have one one editor service to rule them all sort of thing. And, um, if you actually get the latest preview that's going to be coming out soon, you'll actually be able to say file, instead of new PowerShell tab, there's a new PowerShell experimental tab. And that um, is actually using the new editor services. So that's a good way that the community can start to test those editor services. So. To answer the question more directly, if we're not merging the two editors, we're just going to share a lot of the behavior. The yeah, OK, so. sorry. I didn't realize you were sitting right here. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, right. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. Um, getting from a class to a schema mock, how do, you, how do you do that? That's a good question. I don't know if that actually does that. I think it just it does it automatically for you, right? You don't need that. Yeah, because I think that's what this is defining. It's defining the schema mock for you with the properties. And then you implement the actual 
you know, the logic for your resources directly in the class as well. The target computer has to be running D5, so. Right. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thanks for coming, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your conference. <laughs>